Yeah, I volunteer because I volunteer. I'm able to go out with a lot of different institutions uh, over the years, and you know, I've been everywhere from like northern Mexico to Denali National Park to um, some spots in Argentina and elsewhere. So it's something where like I'm not a professional paleontologist, and I have a specific crew and research plan and things like that. But I get to hop to a lot of different places and time periods and try out a lot of different different things and it's nice to find something that you know is going back to a museum is going to have that little like nameplate how would you define being a professional paleontologist i think the most functional way to do it is to think of professional paleontologist as somebody who gets paid to do paleontology by an institution whether that is a university or a museum um, of of some kind and it gets a little bit sticky in, in some ways because there are so many people who are amateurs or avocational, who are experts in their field. There's been people who are like physicists who decided like late in life, like I'm going to study dinosaurs now and became world experts, you know, on that group of animals. Um, and there are so few paid paleontology positions. Just to give you an example, uh, I live in Salt Lake City, so we have the Natural History Museum of Utah here, and there are only three paid paleontology positions, a curator, a collections manager, and a field and lab expert. Everything else is done with volunteer and amateur labor, but some of these people who are working in the lab or um, who are otherwise assisting are experts at what they do. So it's a field that there's this constant tension almost between like who is getting paid and who is getting the credit and who is getting put out front. Where like anytime you see a paleontologist basically on a television show or being interviewed for anything, there is a whole team of people behind them that is making that research possible. You know, I write for a living, so I can say I'm I'm a writer. I didn't go to journalism school, but I report as my job, so like I feel fairly comfortable saying I'm a reporter or, or a journalist. Um, is there is there sort of like a level of discomfort in terms of calling yourself a paleontologist? I don't find any discomfort calling myself a paleontologist. Like, I've done the work. I've published technical literature. I've made significant finds out in the field. I write about the field as part of my living. I was invited to give the uh, keynote talk at the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting last year in uh, Toronto, Canada. And they, they don't do that unless they think you know what you're talking about. So They'll just pluck people off the street. Right, yeah. Um, so I'm completely comfortable calling myself a paleontologist, I think where a lot of people get come up, uh, hung up on these things is the professional amateur divide um, for a variety of reasons. You know, I know some folks say, like, well, you can't call yourself a paleontologist until you have your PhD or until you've published a certain number of papers or something like that. But then again, there are people who, like, I very much feel are paleontologists who are grad students who are probably learning the most about what's going on in their field because it's all new to them. They have to read and look at and study everything, who then get their master's or their dissertation or their PhD, but then there's not a place for them in the field, and they end up leaving it. And I wouldn't be comfortable saying, well, that not person isn't a paleontologist because they didn't hit some kind of academic standard. It's almost a bit of defensiveness. Like, I get that people work really hard for their doctorates, and they work really hard for their positions, but I don't think it really serves us well at all to kind of treat it as this kind of specific club. You know, you kind of at some point have to take people's like work and their arguments, you know, at face value, regardless of what their background is. And obviously, as a professional, you're going to have more access to students and collections and lab equipment and all that other kind of stuff. You can do all sorts of things. But that doesn't mean that the 70-year-old volunteer who's going and finding you know, dinosaur sites for you out in the middle of the desert isn't a paleontologist. And I think that's something where our whole kind of, you know, even what I do, even you know, journalism, plays into this a little bit. Because like, who we talk to, who's the lead author on the paper who gets the attention for stuff. It's still very much all through this academic kind of lens when the reality is so much broader. I write about technology. That's, that's my day job. And, and I talk to a lot of researchers and it dawns on you pretty quickly that it's as in some ways as capitalistic an enterprise as anything else that everybody is to a certain extent doing what they're doing and, what what's the saying? Publish or perish in order to to get those those grants. So like that, having your name at the top of a paper is at the end of the day pretty important for pragmatic reasons. Entirely, and it's something I try and be mindful of when I report on a lot of these studies. Like I make my living primarily as a science writer and as 
a journalist. So I'm constantly writing books. I'm constantly pitching articles to places like National Geographic and Smithsonian and Scientific American. And when I reach out to researchers on paper uh, papers, I often think, okay, well, number one, like, do I want to report on this paper? And there are some, honestly, that I have reported on where the research is cool, but I know that at least one of the people on that paper is a chud, basically, that there, there are harassers and there are problematic people in the field who, like, if I do this, I'm just kind of bolstering the reputation and like, it's, it's not worth it. I don't, I don't want to do that. And then if I am going to report, like, who am I going to talk to on the paper? Is the lead author the best person to, am I going to be able to help like a graduate student or someone earlier in their field? If I talk to them instead, there are all these like small choices that you, that you make that go into all of this that I think, you know, it doesn't directly influence the field. But I think of all the sciences, you know, paleontology is one of the most public facing ones we are constantly talking about. What's this new dinosaur discovery that's going on? Or has someone changed something about Spinosaurus? We need to talk to a whole bunch of people about it, you know, more so than many other fields in like molecular biology or something like that. So I feel like, especially as like sort of an interpreter, and, and even fan of, of paleontology, it really like it, it's changed over time. I think I used to be much more of a um, sort of a cheerleader for science. I just I thought the research was cool, and I thought the stuff was coming out about um, the past was cool. But then as I learned more about sort of the process of science, I realized I have a responsibility in in terms of how am I presenting this, and who am I speaking to, and who am I giving a platform to. And it can be a little bit challenging, but I think it, it makes it makes the reporting better, and it's a better reflection of how the science gets done than just talking about whatever the latest finding was. Early on for you, was that was that a bit of a moral quandary in terms of? I mean, obviously, you want to elevate interesting things and things that feel like breakthroughs, but you know, like in in the arts, they call it separating the art from the artist. But at the end of the day you feel like sort of publicizing that work is effectively platforming somebody. Yeah. I, and I, I think that is the case in, in some cases. There are some people in paleontology, you know, like big, big names in the field um, that I am kind of surprised that we have not had a Me Too moment about yet. And it's not my place to tell those stories, but there's a very active whisper network about, you know, huge names that you, you constantly see. Out there, and it becomes something of a, a, an ethical dilemma of do I want to up this person's reputation? Because I, I would see, like, at meetings, these people that I know are toxic, but people think that their lab is doing, you know, the best or most important or cutting edge work. And I don't want to give the impression that, like, yeah, if you want to go to graduate school, or you want to be a paleontologist, like, that's the person that you should be reaching out. And at that point, it becomes a matter of just my own choices and stuff. Like, you know, I, I'm also a subjective, infallible person. Rather, like, it would be almost easier to just go, I'm just going to report on the science. That's all I'm going to do. I'm not going to pay attention to it. But at some point, I just couldn't do that and anymore. And I, th- I think it matters how stuff gets done, even just in terms of the science. It's like, who are we welcoming into the science? Who Who are we making this accessible to? What kind of viewpoints do we have if everything is from, you know, a cisgender, heterosexual, you know, white middle-aged guy perspective, there's probably going to be a lot of emphasis on things like competition and less so on things like cooperation or any kind of nature, red and tooth and claw, or like these ideas of dominance and stuff versus other aspects. If you're coming from a different background, like might actually inform how we're interpreting all these different things. And that's a whole other sort of kind of worms about, you know, how the you know, relationship between the process of science and, and the scientists doing it. Yeah, it, it just came to a point where I think I, I didn't really know better early on, especially since coming out and thinking about my own relationship to the field and my own relationship to like, how do I feel about these narratives that I keep perpetuating? It didn't feel good to keep doing the same thing anymore, that I really had to start saying something and um, yeah, cha- changing my approach to, to how I interpret this, especially because like there's not anybody else who has my job. There are other science reporters out there. There are other people who talk about and write about dinosaurs. Many of them do it very well. But so far as I know, I am the only full-time paleontology sort of journalist and writer that exists. <laughs> so I really want to do the best I possibly can. I read the article about effectively like not crying in the field 
is that the experience that you outlined there, I, I mean, I think toxic is a, is a fair word to use and, and, and persistent as well. Is that a typical experience for you being out in the field? Honestly, it is. I wish it were a little bit different. I try and choose who I go out with um, in terms of field crews very, very carefully. It's always a little bit of a gamble because so often it's also undergraduates and students and different volunteers who are going out there who have their own ideas and views um, about, you know, queer people in general. You would think that that being with students that, you know, with a younger generation that like theoretically they would be somewhat more progressive. One would hope, but there's there's almost always one. There's almost always one that you know, you have to explain why you know they them pronouns do make grammatical sense, or like unless someone asks you to, don't call them it. <laughs> you know, it's it's something that there's you know most are okay, but it doesn't take all that many where you start to feel like you are now representing sort of all queer people of whatever intersection you're at to answer questions and inform and all this stuff. But you just want to be out there like finding bones. <laughs> you just want to exist. And it, it, I think we're in this moment where people feel like they kind of have a right to, to pry in, in a sense, um, without any kind of foundation of a relationship and interaction. And th- there's so much, I think people understand, even folks who consider themselves progressive. I think, you know, one of the last times I was out in the field, you know, I'm driving the field side, I'm driving the PI out there. And, you know, I've, I've been doing this career, you know, I've been, you know, visible in the field for, you know, about 12 years or so now. It's, it's been a long time. And I transitioned about, started my transition about five years ago when I came out. And there are some people, and I've heard this more than once, where they'll talk about, like, pronouns. And, and you know, it's like, well, you know, like, I, I know trans people aren't going to get, like, you know, jumped down my throat if I use the wrong pronouns or, or whatever, that, that that's overblown. But, I mean, like, for you, if I make a mistake, that's totally fine. It's like, there's this weird sense of, like, they get to excuse themselves <laughs> before they even do it. And I'm just going, like, no, hey, wait a moment. It's, it's been five years. If you can't get it right now. If you have the forethought to have a conversation about the mistake, like, that's probably not an honest mistake. Yeah. I mean, I had some at the last Society of Urban Paleontology meeting. I was sitting down to have a drink with my girlfriend and a friend of mine that I had never met in person before. And, you know, I got finally got to meet this person. And a colleague saw me from across the bar. And he comes over. And he says, you know, hello, just wanted to you know, say good, good to see you. I'm, I'm going to miss your talk. But, you know, I hope you have a good meeting. And then he comes back about 30 seconds later. He says, like, oh, by the way, like, if I misgender you, like, just know that that's like an accident. And I'm just I'm just like sitting there going like, you can't pre-excuse yourself for this and also like it's not like it's a secret this is brand new and it's that sort of thing that i feel like i run into most often it's not necessarily like outright hatred it's just a lot of people who think they're kind of like on the right side of history but they like didn't actually pay attention performative wokeness is how i would describe that yeah (laughs) this actually does reflect on the book as well there is um I think in the conclusion, you know, you really detail. Listen, we all we all had a very shitty couple of years to, to yes. different expense. So I think that that, like, on a very on a base level, is is pretty pretty relatable for everyone. Um, but I also imagine that first getting into this and when you're first starting out writing, that um, maybe your impulse isn't to inject personal things into it. Is to you know. I'm a science writer writing about science. I want to write about this as like in as straightforward a manner as possible. But at a certain point, it kind of gets unavoidable. Like certainly in the the story of you dealing with that on a dig. It's it's kind of funny. So the last days of the dinosaurs, I had the idea for quite some time because like anytime you're writing a book, you get like six more ideas for what you want to do next. Um, so it had been with me for a couple of years, and then it came time to do the next pitch. And I pitched it in the summer of um, 2019, and this is like just months after I had like come out and started hormones very early in my transition. And I just I knew I wanted to write this book, and I was attracted to the topic of you know we often just talk about this mass extinction, right? Like the asteroid hits the planet, it's really obvious what happens next. When it's not, it's probably the strangest mass extinction we've ever had. 
that you know most dinosaurs didn't go extinct over this course of like years to this impact winter like i saw in all these like documentaries and cartoons when i was a kid like the first 24 hours probably took out most of life on this planet much less the three years of impact winter afterwards and how different that was from all these previous ones where it's like up to a million years of grinding change so i really wanted to tell this story and as i was writing it uh and writing it through the the pandemic or at least the early years of the pandemic because we're still in it it felt more and more important to say like why why now why i was telling this story and it's kind of funny because i been working as a science journalist for about a decade at, at that point, and I tried my best to be a good science writer. And I tried my best. I you know injected myself into you know my blogging and some of my previous books, like my beloved Brontosaurus and Skeleton Keys. But it was often very much in like a news you can use kind of way. It was almost like you know I'm not um, the same kind of writer, but like Mary Roach's books, where she's telling you about the science and stuff, was very much through her experience. Of it, and that that felt kind of what was expected in terms of like you know going to the lab and meeting with a researcher. Yes, yes, yes. You you talk about the journey of it. You're, it's meant to be like I am a stand-in for the reader, more or less, so you can discover this as I'm discovering it. And none of those books really did well. <laughs> like I was able to survive as, as a science writer, but you know, like, didn't earn out their advances. It didn't particularly sell well. I was always moving to another publisher. And this one, I said, like you know what, like. I'm finally out after all these years. I'm finally starting my transition. Why not just be a little bit vulnerable? Why not write the book that I feel that I want to write and use my full voice in this, not try and pull it back because I'm going to be afraid that somebody's going to read the conclusion and be turned off by it because I say that I'm trans. Um, which actually I've had the only... They're not even negative reviews. They're positive reviews, but I've had a couple reviews from like conservative news sources where like they call it like trans propaganda or something because I say that I'm trans in the end. Keep your politics out of my sports kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. But meanwhile, they're the sort of people who are like driving the conversation about like I would love to not talk about it, but like you well, guys it's keep the people who consider <laughs> your existence a political act. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I I just felt like it was so important for the context of why I was drawn to the story because it really clicked for me because it wasn't only that I was just coming out I was also I'd been married for thirteen years and I was just going through a divorce at the same time and it felt like all these huge life changes together that it really felt like I kind of had this like age of dinosaurs and then very suddenly much like this mass extinction it just changed in a moment. This was not something like it's a volcano rumbling in the distance and gradually it's going to change stuff over. It was like in the space of a day, my life was going from being one thing to something else. And it flourished in the aftermath. And I just, I felt that personal connection to this idea of resilience and hope and that there there is an after. That's what I kept telling myself during this time in my life, that like as painful as some of these things were and as challenging as some of these things were to start, there's an after to all this, like if I can get there. And I really related to some of these mammals and other critters and stuff like that living in this kind of ashen world that they couldn't obviously think the same way. That'd be anthropomorphizing, but just like that sense of we do today and we do the next day and eventually something new comes from it. It's a heavy topic, though, and the realization that, what, like 99% of all life forms are extinct, like in the history of Earth, I, I don't... Is it is it a difficult thing to draw positive inspiration from? Mass extinction? It, it can be. Um, I view it very much as... I don't want to say two sides of the same coin, but extinction and evolution are, are intertwined. And there's more than one kind of extinction. You know, we often think about extinction as like, you know, the last of anything it disappears and it's gone. It's very, very sad and we grieve that. But another form of extinction is that that population, that species turns into something else. That's why there's an unbroken thread between us and the very first living things on this planet. Everything around us now is part of this ever branching sort of story. And even though like eventually, you know, the species Homo sapiens is going to go extinct, there might be something that comes from us that's after us that, that is part of this continuum. 
It's kind of funny because being a paleontologist really messes with your sense of time and history. You always, I can look, you know, out my window right now and I see like some morning doves, you know, perched on a tree outside. Um, and that tree is a, a flowering plant. It's an angiosperm, which didn't spread until after the mass extinction. And the fact that it's a morning dove, it's a beaked bird, the only surviving dinosaurs from that mass extinction. And we're like 66 million years after this event and I can find traces of it. And yet I can think about, well, these organisms, they have futures as well, and they might become something else. So it feels almost like you're at the middle of this like drop in a pond where you're constantly looking backwards and forwards. It actually makes writing in um, my tenses and my drafts are terrible because <laughs> it's very difficult sometimes to talk about like a fossil where like the fossil is, but it's different from what it was when it was alive. And it's going to be different in the future. So you have basically something that is both the idea of something once alive that's been transformed and how do you properly describe that in the English language. It's actually a very complicated thing sometimes. But I love it. It's it's something that like it is sad. It it, it does involve grief. It does involve getting to know and find joy in these forms of life that you're never gonna see as they were meant to, that you have to imagine them. But that's also where the joy comes in as well, that it is a prompt. I, I like to think of it often as open questions and that the point is not gathering all this knowledge in a huge database. So just that we understand and then it's done and then it's solved. It's this constant inv- invitation to think about the past and our relationship to it and what we understand. Um, that's the part that really engages me. It's just the, the sheer curiosity of it. It's something that sometimes you can't even directly measure or describe what you would like to, but you knew it must have been there. And you can still think about it and imagine it and wonder, like, how would I even begin to envision what life was like for this creature? Uh, and and I love I love that. It feels like something that, like, I, I knew I didn't want to give up. You know, people talk about the relationship between dinosaurs and children, and often we get asked, like, oh, were you a dinosaur kid? Are you basically just like a grown-up child now because you still like dinosaurs? It's like... That's not exactly it. It's just that sense of wonder and curiosity, and it requires that step of your imagination. That's the part of it that I love. Yeah, I, I, th- th- there are expectations in society that we that there are things that we grow out of, and I think you know, I think dinosaurs is, are probably one of those things for most people. Which is funny because things like Jurassic World made a billion dollars. You're talking about like, oh, like dinosaurs are kid stuff and stuff. Like you just went and saw a movie where a bunch of dinosaurs ate a bunch of people. (laughs) You know, superheroes, these are all kids things, but these are all the things that are like, this is culture now. Exactly. Yeah. And I was asked, I need to finish the chapter, honestly. I feel very bad that I haven't finished this. I was asked to write a chapter on Dinomania for this ongoing these ongoing volumes called The Complete Dinosaur that gets a revision every few years. And it's a hard one to get around because I feel like people often want a single answer, right? It's, it's you know, what was the spark? What really made dinosaurs? Like, what they are in our public consciousness? Why, out of all the things I've ever lived, we're expected to go through a dinosaur phase? And you can buy, like, almost anything with the dinosaur on it. And you know, we see the movies, and we play the games, and all this sort of stuff. I think the genesis of it had to do with just like upending expectations back in the 1960s and 1970s and that you, know, you had this view of these animals that were living in swamps and they were still popular then. Like the public loved them. That's why museums kept putting the museum halls because they're big and impressive and weird. And we thought we had a lock on what they were like and then all of a sudden it's totally flipped and totally different. This mass extinction is unlike anything that happened before. And that bled out into, you know, magazine stories and new museum exhibits and, you know, even just de- the technology of the time, the dynamation exhibits, the animatronics and stuff that would tour around and mm-hmm. you got to see and things like Jurassic Park. And at that point, it's just marketing, really. Like, I remember living, it, like, I was born in 1983. I remember growing up that I could put on, like, my dinosaur jammies to go on my dinosaur sheets to wake up to eat my dinosaur cereal, watching the cartoon while playing with it. Like, it was everywhere. And it's a little bit less than what it was. But I think at this point, we just kind of elected them to be these celebrities. And there's no single reason why it just, it's just part of the sort of cultural lattice at, at, at this point that they're, they really powerfully embody the fact that some 
you know, like life goes extinct, life also evolves, the time is very, very long, and there's some weird stuff in the past. So <laughs> life, you know, used to be very, very different. And that is so powerful and so accessible that it's really kind of a wonder that they didn't become these mascots like earlier. But then again, like I would say like, you know, the word dinosaur was coined in 1842. Uh, by a hundred years after that, I'd say they hit celebrity status, like or at least in terms of cultural awareness. So almost from the time that they were discovered, there was a time period where people kind of like looked down on them a little bit, but for over a hundred years, we've loved our dinosaurs. And I think that's going to just keep going. You touch on this a little bit, but I, I, you can't underestimate size in that conversation. I think that's such a big part of it. And I think that's, that is, that's the thing that captures our imagination. I mean, if these things were running around and they were all monitor lizards, I, I, I don't think that they would get this this much excitement. And 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 you and you use a term that that was similar. You know, they they, they have that term charismatic megafauna. Yes. And and you use the word charismatic. I think at some point in the book to describe dinosaurs. And I think that captures a lot of it. It's something where like I wish people would get more excited about the little ones because they're super cool. But the si- the size it 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 does matter. It, it is important. Um, it is it is something that people they're drawn to and i wonder how much of that is because we live presently in a megafaunal lull because anytime i give a talk one of the first questions that i get no matter what i'm speaking about just like if you know here's rightly black she's speaking about paleontology one of the first questions i always get is why was everything bigger in the past and i usually have to unpack that because like okay well number one like not everything was bigger and there are different reasons at different times and we can talk about all those sorts of things like the reasons that insects were big and the carboniferous is not the same that you had big sauropods in the jurassic or what have you but people get hung up on that aspect and i think we're kind of missing that and it's strange in a sense like this is the first time in millions of years that most continents don't have a whole bunch of really big animals running around on it you know we basically are still in the shadow of the end place to see extinctions where it wasn't just that there were big animals around, but that you had several species of saber toothed cats. You had several species of really big bears and mammoths and giant ground sloths and this whole menagerie of large animals um, roaming around at such a diversity, filling the environment in such a way. And they went extinct and there hasn't been a replacement for that. So I feel like for many of us, you know, the largest animal that we're likely to see, you know, like so on a daily day basis is probably my dog, who's about 75 pounds. It's mostly see squirrels and stuff like that. And like maybe if I'm lucky, I'll see a mule deer or something like that. Um, but outside of the zoo or, you know, watching a documentary, like life around us seems pretty small. And then you go to a museum and you see this thing that's 100 feet long and it's, you know, like 15 feet high at the shoulder or whatever. And you're absolutely dwarfed by this thing. And it's... It's hard not to be impressed. I, I, I think that that sense of feeling small, I think similar to like when you look out into space and you, or you see the stars in the Milky Way and you get that sense of like, I am on this, you know, basic, I'm on this planet, but there's so much more out there. Uh, I think dinosaurs do something very, very similar for us. And in some ways it doesn't require that much unpacking. It's just, a, it's something that resonates and, and probably always will. Anytime I'm reading about a, a dinosaur on Wikipedia, I immediately go to that little drawing of the little person <laughs> next to it for yeah, scale. Just like, the way. It's yeah. immediately where my, where my eye my eye is drawn because that it like it's kind of you know one of the most interesting things. But but I also think that you know I, I live in New York City and we, you know we've got a amazing natural history museum and it's got that giant blue whale in it. Yes, and like let's not discount the fact that we're living at a time with probably the largest organism animal to ever live. I remember growing up in New Jersey and I, my first big museum trip, I've been to a few local ones, but the first like really big institution I've been to was the American Museum of Natural History um, outside Central Park. And, you know, that's where a lot of these, all the pictures and toys and everything else, like it didn't really even make sense until I saw those bones, until I could stand there and look at them and see that they were real and think about like what would it sound like? How did it move? What did the environment 
look like, all the stuff that's still rattling around my head today. In fact, there's a great documentary that came out, I think, in like 1985, um, starring uh, Christopher Reeve. Um, it's called Dinosaur, with an explanation point. You can find it on YouTube. And it's one of my absolute favorites because it's all shot within those halls back bef- back when they were still relatively dark and shadowy. And as much as I love modern museum design and you know, trying to make things bright and open and more accessible, I really love the ones that are kind of dim and shadowy and you get the sense that there might be like dinosaur ghosts in there. Not that I believe them, but there's, there's, there's something a little extra about it that, you know, trains your focus on these animals and what they might've been like, that you feel like you're kind of locked in there with them. And it just fires my imagine, imagination in a way that it doesn't in sort of the bright daylight. It really just, took such a hold of me in in that moment and that's what keeps me going back to to all these things and you know as silly as it is like you know i do my best to be a professional be up on the science have all my technical stuff down but like once i was doing field work at a place called cleveland Lloyd dinosaur quarry here in eastern utah and there are torrential downpours the whole field team like almost everybody was rained out everybody is soaking wet and this is in the middle of utah summer so no one had planned for for rain because we get we have like the second lowest rainfall of any state possible it was a total disaster and there's a uh, reconstruction of allosaurus the jurassic carnivore in the middle of this and what we did that night is everybody dried off as i had a laptop and we opened the case of Takate because that was all that was left. And I fired up Jurassic Park and then I threw out my sleeping bag underneath that Allosaurus skeleton just because, like, I wanted that moment again. I wanted to be able to look up at this thing's bones and think about what it was like. And I think that sense of wonder, I think it's, it's important to emphasize because so often, I think, with paleontology, we talk about these ma- the mastery of facts. Like, do you know how long this thing was? How heavy it was? What's your evidence for backing this or that up? And that's all great and important stuff. But the wonder of it, that's really what even just drove this latest book that I wrote. Like, I was tired of writing about descriptions of how we discovered things and all the measurements and everything else. I wanted to basically play with these animals as I saw them in my head. It's almost like fan fiction in that way of just like, of like, of world building, obviously, you know, with the facts that you have. But as you were earlier, as you were describing tenses in terms of how to refer to uh, a fossil, you know, I was looking down at my phone and looking at the book. I finished it recently and completely forgot. I was like, I think it, the entire thing was written in present tense, but I need to double check. And it was. And that's a very that's a very deliberate decision for a book that takes place, you know, sixty five million years ago. Yeah. I, I struggle with that first because in some ways writing in past tense or sort of this kind of third person omniscient, you know, it's saying like everything like just like the moment after it happened or so is is a much more comfortable way way to write. Sometimes writing in present it's tense. It's easier. Is hard. It's like yeah. default. Like that's how most yeah. things are written. Right. But present tense it it felt vital. Like if I'm talking about these things being alive, I want to talk about them being alive because if I'm constantly using the past tense, I'm just reminding everybody of the ending. I can't really get somebody lost in the Paleocene if I'm constantly reminding them that, you know, it was something that happened 65 million years ago. This is sort of, it's something I like to do. Like I remember when 3d movies were really like in in vogue and, and almost everything had a 3d release. And I remember when I'd go see them that sometimes I had a hard time paying attention to like what the main point was because you could kind of like look around the screen. You could look into the background and kind of see like, oh, it's like what's in that cabinet. It's like you kind of like look around the way that you look around a room. And that's the kind of feeling that I wanted to give people like just enough information that they could feel that they were there and they were kind of looking around and how they were imagining this, this setting. Whereas if whenever I thought about using the past tense, it felt like it just kind of like flattened everything out. It was like using time to just kind of squish everything down to, I'm telling you a series of events that transpired. And I wanted more of a feel of like, we're there with our boots on the ground, watching this critter scurry around or watching this fern grow or whatever it is. It it felt very important to making it a a living story. When you were discussing some of these kind of more toxic people um, in, in the industry, you touch on something that that's to me is a very interesting point um, that I think I don't know I don't know that this applies to all science in the same way and in fact I don't think that it does but there is a level of what you had said is you know how how they how these people interpret things 
And there's a, there's a level of almost like subjectivity that has to go into a lot of this because I mean, obviously it's entirely based on fact, um, but you're hanging some imagination on top of that. And you're discuss. I heard you discussing this with, with another paleontologist of just like, I had to make this decision for this reason. You talk about this in a book too, you know, there, there are probably some ways in which it makes for a more interesting story, or there's a, there's a triceratops like dinosaur with the, the perforated skull that, may or may not be an actual dinosaur, but you choose to, you chose to include it. There, there has to be a little bit of subjectivity that goes into a project like this. Entirely. And that's why I wanted to write the appendix for it, because I wanted to lay out, you know, what we know and that paleontology really is filling in, even playing with these, these gaps in our knowledge. One of the examples that I use, and I, I, it's one of my favorite examples to use. There's a book called The World Before the Deluge that was printed in the 19th century after Archaeopteryx, the first bird, was discovered. And that first skeleton that was recognized, the London specimen, they didn't recognize the head on it at first. Um, there were teeth and jaws on there. They thought they were the jaws of a fish. So for it took a couple of years to recognize that. And in that interim, everyone was like, well, we don't really know what the head looks like. We don't know whether it had a beak. We don't know whether it had teeth. Um, and the, the illustrator for this particular book drew this Jurassic forest full of conifers, and it had Archaeopteryx with its wings spread over this forest, and it's headless. And I just found that so ridiculous that you're doing this living scene, this animal in its environment. We know it's a vertebrate, we know it's a bird that must have had a skull and jaws, whether toothed or not, a central nervous system. But this person's like, well, I need to stop there because it might not be accurate. It's like so much else that you've already illustrated is either conjectural or informed by something else. That's why one of the bases for paleontology is comparative anatomy. Like, early, Especially early in its history, it was often said it was basically a combination of comparative anatomy and geology. And that origin really means that you know the whole reason we can understand so much about certain bones is that we can look to living animals and see the same muscle scars the same nerve openings you're always comparing between the past and the present in some way and find the common denominators for a lot of these animals you know, it's one of the wonderful things about um what we call homology in evolutionary sciences that you know you often have the same parts but they're fashioned in different ways and you can kind of suss that out to, if you know your anatomy well enough and I think it's important to highlight that this isn't a matter of just looking at a skeleton. You can tell everything about it, you know, as if you're divining it directly from the bones. That so much of this relies on comparison, or you're making a logical argument that you know, okay, like I see a cavity inside of its skull, and it looks like a brain. That's probably the brain, and the brain probably seems to have large olfactory bulbs. We know that animals that have that have a good sense of smell. So there's no way to test the dinosaur's sense of smell in any sense of the word. But we can make that hypothesis and support it, and it seems pretty reasonable. And I really wanted to bring that, you know, I wanted that to be part of the story, both because I think it's important to sort of show my work for something like this. And I was a little bit worried, and I've seen this in a few of, like, the uh, reader reviews who were maybe expecting a different book of this being just said, well, it's paleo fiction, and I'm just making things up off the top of my head. And... For me, it's more like I've been living with these studies and stories and animals and ideas for you know most of my life and working with them professionally for more than a decade. This is me kind of finally letting them loose on paper. This is the stuff that we think about and talk about, you know, aside from the technical paper where you have to be so precise and passive voice. Because there wasn't really another paleontology book like that. There's um, an older one that Edwin Colbert wrote called Year of the Dinosaur. Bob Bakker did uh, Raptor Red, you know, years and years ago, which is a little bit more fanciful, but similar sort of idea. And this is kind of my homage to the genre. But through my particular lens, like you were saying, like, science is done by people. People are subjective. We do our best to show our work and to narrow things down to you know, measurements and data that could be repeated and tested and, you know, all those things that are so important for the science. But the theory, the hypothesis, like what we think about what a particular animal is doing, you know, that's why dinosaurs keep changing. You know, the bones are the same as they're everywhere. It was entirely possible that the first person, for example, to describe a T-Rex could have figured out that its posture was different or that it, you know, moved in a certain way or like all the things that we know now. They could have worked a lot of that out, but they were working with a different framework 
and that's the whole reason it's changed. And it would have felt dishonest if I kind of put myself out there as like this authority, I'm going to tell you what the reality was when the entire history of science tells me it's like, yeah, in 10 or 20 or 50 years, someone's probably going to read my book and be like, wow, was she wrong about a lot of this stuff? <laughs> At a certain point, you have to decide whether that's fr that's frustrating or or exciting, knowing that none of this will ever be finished. I think it's exciting. I mean, especially as I've carved this little niche for myself as, you know, a very much like out queer person in paleontology and science, I want to hear other people's stories and interpretations. I, I kind of love when I find out that I'm wrong about something or we have a new discovery that changes what we previously knew. Um, Cause that usually that leads to the question of why, well, how did we find that out? What, what's the new information here? And does that lead to additional questions or additional queries? And to me, it kind of creates this bridge of conversation across years and across generations. And I feel like science media and science writing in particular has often struggled with this. I think it has a lot to do with the sort of the business models that we've had, that where a lot of this work is disseminated. I remember, you know, growing up in the 1980s and 1990s, kind of the end of like the magazine um, is right before the collapse. And you had people, you know, you had. And I'm not a fan of necessarily all of these. Stephen Jay Gould is um, a huge fan of, but um, you had other folks like you know, like Richard Dawkins, and Neil Wilson, Carl Sagan, and um, you know, just all of these other authors that were getting like you know, they'd have books that sold well, and they'd have columns in you know national magazines and stuff, and they'd have these debates that then other people would write books about, and there seemed to be this drive to have like these big interpreters of science where like this was the person who was going to explain once and for all how evolution works to you. And I think in some ways we've continued in some of that tradition that we have like particular people like these are the most recognizable science writers or science journals. These are the interpreters of the scientific record and they're going to do their best to tell you the facts about nature and natural history. When really the way that I feel about it is like, I don't want to be a household name. I don't want to be a bestseller or anything. Like, I want to be somebody who like, here's how I see it. How do you see it? And to have this conversation that kind of broadens out from from these moments um, in our very fragmented and fractured sort of media ecosystem. But I think the time of having sort of these chief interpreters, like, you know, very much how we had Carl Sagan, and then people wanted Neil deGrasse Tyson to be kind of like the replacement, and that didn't work for, kind of, thank goodness. Um, but, yeah, I, I think things have changed so much that I feel more comfortable, and I feel like it's more useful to people in general to be like, this is something I know I'm probably seeing some of this wrong, or maybe I'm seeing this, you know, in this idiosyncratic way because of who I am and, and where I'm coming from. But if you can look at it from a different background and you see some similar things, then maybe we're getting somewhere in terms of figuring something out. Or maybe you're going to see something that like nobody's realized before. And I, I love that idea of sharing a little bit to stoke conversation. And that's what keeps driving things forward. Me just going like, this is mine and this is my interpretation and I'm an expert. That doesn't really get anybody anywhere. I'm somebody who I, I deal with a lot of anxiety, depression. These things were heightened over the last three years. Um, and you've written and talked about that aspect of your life as well. Um, I, I certainly would consider myself an introvert in spite of, you know, effectively like interviewing people for a living and going out on stage and talking to a lot of people. It, it, is it oftentimes difficult to put yourself out there in that way? Oh, entirely. I had an interview for a story earlier this week where I had to talk to the curator of the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum about a Quetzalcoatlus like model that was made in the 80s. And I hate phone calls. So I was just like, oh, geez, how's this going to go? And That's a millennial thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, but, but even over emails, like my job involves like cold calling basically researchers all the time. And sometimes there are maybe two, three experts on a particular topic, like in the world for, for me to talk to. Like I would just describe this um, Cambrian jellyfish that was found in the Burgess Shale. So it took me about an hour of just like sifting through various papers and, and going like, okay, who do I talk to? Who's most likely to give me an answer? Who's most likely to be 
available and then just hoping that when I send this email, basically I'm asking them to do work for free. You know, the the only hope I have is that they think the paper is cool enough or outrageous enough or whatever it is to, to comment on. And it's it seems like I picked a weird career choice for somebody with CPTSD and some anxiety and he's autistic and all that fun stuff. But I just have to keep doing it. It's, I have too many questions and too much curiosity. And I think so much of it is when I see some of these new papers and you say, I just go like, this is cool. Like I want to tell people about it. And that's what kind of helps me override all the interviewing and paperwork and things like that, that needs to come with it. Like, um, you know, earlier this month, um, I had a gender affirming surgery and I've been planning for this for quite some time. And I was trying to get all my work off my desk. And I was telling myself the week before I'm not going to take any more assignments. I, I need to rest. I need to be ready. And then just before a paper comes out, or is you know like next week, and I think it, I can't remember what was Nature or Science, but basically next week we are announcing what may be the largest creature that have ever lived, a new fossil whale. And they showed the illustration, and it is the cutest, like chunkiest thing I'd ever seen. Absolutely, Perusetus is this tiny head, massive body. It was you know up to possibly like three hundred tons, and I was just like, okay. I need to write about this. So I remember like being, you know, in the hospital in recovery, still hitting like the button for like the morphine every couple of minutes as I need it, tapping on my phone, getting edits back to my editor, because I just I had to tell this story. And that's that's the stuff that keeps me writing, is is that there's always something else. There's always something unexpected. The fossil record in particular is always going to surprise us. And that's the part that helps me get over some of the more complicated, I think, social aspects of being a journalist and, and a science writer. Yeah, I mean, to peel back the curtain a little bit, when I asked you to do this, you basically said, I'm recuperating from surgery. I've got all the time in the world. So, like, yeah. clearly, and, and you know, may, may, maybe, like, e even as somebody who, you know, again, I, an introvert myself, like, I had that thing of, like, maybe enjoying elements of the pandemic more than I should have in terms of like being completely alone with my rabbit. But at the end of the day, then, you know, you're, you're alone and you've been alone for two months and you look around and you're like, shit, like I, I do as much as I hate to admit it, like I do need to interact with other people like this, you know, I do need to talk to people. I can't just be entirely alone. Yeah. It's, it was difficult finding a balance. I think, you know, writing and, and doing what I do helped a little bit because, um, you know, as everyone began to work from home, and I, I wish we still had you know as much access to that as, as we did. I was like, "Well, I've been working from home for about like eight or nine years." This, but it did feel different. It did feel more isolating. But it was also good to be able to reach out to people around the world about these fascinating things and maybe think about something else other than the pandemic for a minute. Not to say that the pandemic was important. In fact, I remember very early on those first couple of months early in 2020, where it was almost impossible for me to pitch a story about anything else, because that was just the constant story, just, you know, the, this new virus, the, the, or the beginnings of, of the pandemic. And over time, that shifted a little bit. And I think we can do both. I think we can recognize the seriousness of these things, but also that they're is more to the world. There is more to the history. There is more to the, the, the planet. And I know it's helpful in some ways to be able to reach out to people and just say like, hey, I know everything is weird. Can we talk about this new Tyrannosaur for 20 minutes? And I could almost hear the relief sometimes that we just had something else that was cool and interesting to, to share. Um, in some ways... Uh, field work changed quite a bit. Like a lot of field programs like stopped. I used to go out like almost a week out of basically May through early October. I'd be out in the field almost every month for at least a couple of days. And a lot of those programs, a lot of those like sort of networks where how you get asked to go to one thing or another have kind of broken down a little bit. So now I get antsy sometimes. Sometimes like I just, I need to go out to the desert today. Like I know it's like a three hour drive away. I'm just going to get up at like two in the morning. I'm going to go and I'm going to do this hike and I'm going to look at the fossils. And I mean, I come home just because I need to do it. So I feel like we're still, at least for me, I'm still kind of finding my balance, you know, as everything's continued to shift around. But yeah, it, it was a both the best and worst time to write a book about one of the ends of the world. And 
I didn't intend it to be so relevant to our present moment, but that's the way it just it just kind of worked out, and it's kind of funny to me. I wonder, looking back at it, you know, some however many years from now, if I go back and I read that book, um, you know, I, I said it explicitly in the conclusion, at least personally, but how much that moment in time formed what my perspective was and what the takeaway from that story was because I just felt like it was so then to talk about like his or his worst day as bad as it could possibly get things still somehow continued and we can hold that sense of both grief and hope together we don't need to choose one or the other like they can kind of inform each other and that's maybe how we move forward whenever i'm talking to somebody who has a paperback coming out i like to ask a question of you know effectively like how how the relationship with the work has changed in you know the, the past year but it's a it's especially interesting in this case both in terms of again personal and the the global um setting in which this was written but also that maybe some things changed maybe 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 there are some things that because of papers or other things that have come to light that you're maybe you wouldn't have written them in the same way so i'm curious if if at all i know again geologically a year is not a, a <laughs> lot of time for things to change in but you know it's, it's a lot of chi- time for people to change yeah in terms of research, I think the book is still pretty sound. We've had a few papers that would like lead to minor things, like I might have made a point about um, T-Rex having lips in that first chapter, because we had a paper about that. But in terms of like the overall story, how the extinction played out, aside from relatively minor details, I think it, it's, still, it's still an accurate story. It, it's still really emphasizing how strange this event was compared to anything else. It really was the combination of the worst case scenario that there could have possibly been and how life came back from that. Um, we have a couple new papers about paleocene mammals that I might have worked into there. Like there was a neat one about how like their body size got big earlier than their brain size. So you had these things that were like the size of like a rat, even like cat size are smaller, like at the end of the Cretaceous, they survive, they get into the paleocene there's all this green food around because forests can now grow dense without dinosaurs knocking everything over all the time. Their body size gets big, but their brains are still the same size as they were back in the Cretaceous. So there wasn't a lot of behavioral complexity that sort of like opening up these niches and stuff happened in this complex way. And it wasn't this lockstep kind of change that we might, might expect. And that's pretty cool. In terms of my relationship to the book, it's kind of funny because I'm working on the sequel right now, which is going to be a very similar trying to put people in the past, but talking about the relationship between animals and plants through time. That plants kept doing these things like oxygenating the atmosphere or starting to grow on lands or d- evolving relationships with pollinators um, or evolving defenses that then like lead to fun things like catnip. I have this chapter involving saber-toothed cats getting high on catnip and why that why that happens and why that works. And writing this now reminds me of the process for writing the last days of the dinosaurs. I was convinced that people were going to hate it. I was convinced that my editor was not going to see what I was trying to do and that the reviewers are going to be, well, this is just fiction. This is just imagination. There's not really anything worthwhile in here. And that has to do with like many years of depression and dysphoria and generally feeling like you know, imposter syndrome and feeling like somehow, despite writing for every major outlet that I've ever wanted to write for and publishing multiple books, I'm fooling everybody somehow about my expertise. So I basically like wrote it down as fast as I could and just kind of like threw it at my publisher. And I was like, okay, I hope this does all right. But given that none of my previous books did particularly well, I was like making my piece for it. It's like, I'll get the last advance check and I'll just do the next thing. And this is the first book that I've ever had. Like, I'm not trying to brag. I'm just kind of still in shock about this and thankful to everybody who's picked it up. It's the first book I've ever had that's earned out its advance. That's relatively rare for a science book. It earned out its advance. I actually like have a royalty check now that helps support some of this other transition related care that like I've been wanting to do. Um, And that's been a wonderful thing. And it's really encouraged me in terms of writing this next book because, again, it's even though I've done this multiple times and I've only had like one negative review after writing like however many books, um, I still tell myself like I don't know if this is going to be good. I don't know if people are going to like this. Um, this 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 one might be might, might be the dud. And just being able to say like 
you wrote something that was very vulnerable and that there's no other dinosaur book quite like it and people loved it. So maybe just keep doing what you love doing. And I'm happy to see it come out. And the last days of the dinosaurs come out in paperback. I hope more people pick it up. I know some people, it's like they don't want the hardcover. They want to wait for the paperback for one reason or another. But I'm, I'm glad that this book, like the story, it's still finding people. Like it, it, it makes me happy that I'm still getting emails about it. I'm still getting requests to talk about it. I feel like it's something that, it hit on something greater than just what the subject is about. Like, yes, it is about this mass extinction. If you read the book, you will certainly learn about what happened 66 or 65 million years ago. But I think in this moment that we're in, where everything is still strange, I think we're still very much in our own kind of like impact winter of everything that transpired um, from 2020 onwards. I think it still holds that relevance. And while I'm sad for that, I'm glad that people are finding the book and finding something personal in it. And I hope that continues to be the case. I'm not going to spend, you know, the, the last few minutes of podcast reeling on the American healthcare system. Yeah. <laughs> he said something in there that really s- struck me. Um, I'm trying to not, but like to find a point on it or, or be hokey or cheesy talking about, Go but there's it. a very, y- you, were, you were talking about earning the book advancing. You were talking about be, being able to afford, this healthcare. And, and I know, you know, as you said, you had that surgery recently and there's a very real and tangible way in which this book is helping you become the person you are. Yeah. It's something that for all the discussions that are going on, just to be very direct about it, with all the discussions that are presently happening about transgender people in various forms of media, including outlets that should know better, like the New York times and the Atlantic, some of those, like the reasons that I've, get cranky with them so much because they really should know better and how defensive they are that their reporting is good when it's actually very harmful. But there's so much emphasis put on our bodies and changes to our bodies and what those things do and whether that's fair to other people, um, which is entirely the wrong emphasis to have. In terms of whether what you do to yourself has any impact on anyone else's life? Yeah, in terms of you know the fact that just transgender women were just banned from, or at least post- uh, it's the postponement from uh, playing in chess tournaments because we're not sure whether we have an unfair advantage against other women or not. Um, you know, even just more fi- you know physical sports as well. That we have the science, we have the details, we we have the evidence that we are not a threat to these systems that we've participated in previously. But it's this manufactured outrage that we can track directly to specific um, conservative groups like Alliance Defending Freedom and Christian Nationalist Organizations. A very funny thing of of how many people suddenly care about women's sports. Yes. Yeah. All of a sudden, after all this time, there's a great book called Sexing the Body that goes into this specifically with sports in detail that I very much recommend about this. And just, it, yeah, how, how suspicious this moment is this moment is. So you have all this emphasis on sort of not only should we be able to, you know, alter our sex and change our our gender presentation, but what bathrooms we can use, what sports we can play, what stories we can tell, um, this multi-pronged assault that's fixated on us right now. And meanwhile, the reality of so much of this, like, it doesn't get reported and it doesn't get talked about. Like, for every change that I've had to do, how much of it, like, even if I have an operation that's covered by insurance, how much I need to spend on therapy or electrolysis for hair removal or various consultations or travel or things like that is very expensive if you want to medically transition to do so. And it affects a great deal of your life. And I feel honored that enough people have enjoyed the last days of the dinosaurs that this book that I wrote at the very beginning of my transition was just coming into myself. And a lot of these things seem far off for me that I didn't know when they were going to happen. Now it's done well enough where I can not only, you know, pay for my own needs in this messed up healthcare system that we have, but I can also it's like throw friends who need a, a couple bucks and help support their transitions as well. It's it's absolutely bizarre, but I, I you know, I want to believe that the people who you know keep hammering on us, who keep 
calling people like me basically a menace to society at large, and then we're going to be the death of you know the United States or Western civilization or whatever it is they're actually afraid of. That it is a small group of people, and that most people that I know, most people that I run into and bump into, are just like, yeah, be you, be happy. That's mostly what I feel like I'm I'm running into, and just as evidence of this, this is a little shaven fraud on my part. So um, about a year or so ago, Tucker Carlson called me out on his show because I gave an interview to NPR saying that dinosaurs are trans icons, primarily because of Jurassic Park, but also like basically um, transphobes at the time were trying to use dinosaurs as a dog whistle. That's chum in the water for yeah. Tucker Carlson. Right, exactly. So it's like you know, NPR did a, a segment on a trans woman saying dinosaurs are trans icons. It's like, of course, he would say something. And you know what? Nothing happened. I got like one email, but nobody cared. And the fact that he just came out with a book that sold like 3,000 copies and bombed, and I wrote a book about dinosaurs and how they relate to my trans experience, and it's done super duper well, I would, it's not, you know, a sign that everything is fine because everything isn't fine, but I would like to think that there are a lot of people out there who are beginning to understand why these things are important. And how they're related, and that trans people are not the villains that you know the media is constantly saying that we are. If you want to s- stick it to Tucker Carlson, buy a copy of Riley's book. That's the best way to do yeah. it. <laughs> and it, it, it's a win-win, really. 